So today we're going to be um, uh, dipping into um, reading again, our second week in thinking about reading. Well, it's not really our second week because we've been doing and thinking about reading for a long time. You're all expert readers. Um, but it's really a, a, an attempt again to, um, to think about what this reading process is and uh, how we might understand it. So we might start with just a brief look at um, the last, couple, last week, in fact, and the sorts of ideas we were looking at there as a way of reconnecting with, um, with this idea. So last week we proposed um, an understanding of reading um, defined like this pretty broadly. Reading is a process of making meaning with and through language and other semiotic resources. So when we start with this kind of, uh, with this sense of reading, then um, a whole range of opportunities open up for us in terms of thinking about reading practices, thinking about the social nature of reading, thinking about young people's reading beyond school. Many of you have been uh, posting on the forum this week um, about your own reading experiences. Um, some of you have had real, it sounds like real gr grappling or struggling with connecting to the sorts of reading you were doing before university. You did have reading lives before you just got asked to read academic text all the time, it seems. Some of you still hold on to to parts of your reading histories that aren't sort of um, exclusively academic. So it's been really interesting seeing some of those posts come through and, and thinking about how our reading practices are shaped by the context we're in. It's um, you know, clearly part of the discussion we want to have with you is how does school, how does English classing, how does that shape the reading practices that people do in particular ways. So we looked at um, texts like Pokemon Go. Um, and uh, how we might think of that as a, as a particular text with a set of reading practices um, that are individual and social, mediated by the digital, but also um, clearly um, out in the world. Clearly, uh, we're not just talking about school reading. Um, we made the point, too, that um, while we can get some advice from curriculum documents, and we'll be doing that a little bit later in the lecture, hopefully we'll get to that, um, young people, as the, the argument in um, this book uh, that was published a couple of years ago, um, young people are much more than empty vessels to be filled with the knowledge and skills that comprise the outcome statements that have come to typify curriculum documents over the last couple of decades. The argument was that young people, the young people you'll be teaching in just a few weeks and that you've been teaching um, last semester and in previous years if you've been around for a while, bring into the classroom worlds of language and experience that allow teachers to, well, to, to, it's a resource for us, for our work. It's not just, you know, young people bring their experiences and somehow we've got to, um, you know, um, wipe those away. We've got to take those away and start fresh somehow, that we have an agenda that we'd like to, to pursue and that young people just have to sort of get on board with that. We don't actually have to think about the work we do with young people in that way. We can think of it in quite a different way as as we've indicated, they're a rich resource for their meaning making. We're always working with that. That led us to thinking about the whom. Of course, young people are diverse, just like all of us are. They come from different backgrounds, different experiences, um, and those experiences and, and backgrounds um, mean that we have to really think hard about the whom. Who are we teaching? And um, how does that shape what we might do? So we might be you know, out in a government school in the northern suburbs or out the west. We might be in a different kind of school in, in the inner east of Melbourne. Um, but all of those young people have particular experiences that mean we need to be attuned to their lives and their interests. Um, not necessarily stay with those, but that we need to begin there. We talked about the what. We looked at some curriculum documents. We, we asked questions about what are we doing when we're teaching reading? What's its relationship to viewing and English overall? Um, and what we think of what we're doing is partly about teaching literacy or language or literature. That's the way the curriculum is framed around those three strands, literacy, language and literature. When we're teaching reading, is it distinct from those or is it somehow connected? How do we think about reading as perhaps a, a part and parcel of each of those strands or dimensions? I'm not, I'm not sure what they're called these days. Maybe they're not strands, maybe they're dimensions. Um, and uh, finally, we looked at the why, uh, that 
we can get advice about the why from some places, but it's often not talked about a lot. It's often assumed that um, the why is the same for everybody and, and that uh, young people need to know how to read. That's a sort of, um, you know, no one's going to argue with that sort of statement, I suppose. So is that the only reason why we'd be teaching these? And how do we develop a language to do that? So we propose that documents like the Stella uh, website and the statements can provide us with some why. There are some of these statements in curriculum documents as well, but often we've got to search for them. They're often in the framing statements. And so the whom, the what and the why provide us with a, a really safe way. Well, safe in the sense that it's a good way to do it, is to start our journey to think of thinking about reading. If we miss any of these dimensions, we're likely to um, miss an important component of um, what we're talking about. Okay, so that's just as a, a way of introducing or reconnecting with us, all of us with the sorts of ideas we're going to be looking at. In terms of today, we're going to revisit some ideas from English A. Now, um, that's in a way to remind you that um, we're not just talking about reading now, but you've done also already done a lot of thinking about reading. Um, it might not have seemed that way to you, or um, we might not have used that particular framework, but we want to show you the way in which some of the activities and ideas that you came up against last semester are connected. And so what we're really doing, I suppose, is not moving through um, a set of ideas in a linear way from start to end, just like young people in English classes. Is that how it works? Not really. But the journey through your course here is more often um, a bit winding and a bit circular and a bit moving back on, and a bit of revisiting ideas that we may have looked at before. So we'll do a bit of that and then we're going to introduce the idea of framing that comes from um, some work by Gail McLaughlin and Ian Reid back in the 90s. Mm, I wonder if there's anything to reclaim from the 90s. What do you think, Fleur? Anything good happened in the 90s? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Fleur and I have this thing. It's all about the 90s. I think we're stuck in a time war, aren't we, Fleur? <laughs> Speak for myself. So we're going to think about this idea of framing. If you've had a look at Gail McLaughlin and Ian Reid's Sorry, it's actually just Gail McLaughlin's piece. But it's a paper from the journal Idiom, which is the Vate Journal. And um, it's a very small piece. Um, and it's one of the prescribed readings for this week. So if you haven't yet read it, please do. Um, and then we'll be looking at some big curriculum stuff. OK, so back to semester one. So here's, um, here's a strategy that was in that uh, English for the Australian Curriculum textbook. Three-level guide to reading a text. Have you come across this one before? Maybe some of you have come across it before I see a couple of nods. Pretty easy. Level one, literal, on the face of it. What does a text say? What words and images support your reading or your answer? Literal readings. Level two, inferring, reading between the lines. What does the text suggest? What can you infer from the text? And level three, evaluation and application. What views, values and beliefs are communicated? How does the text connect to me and to the world in which... We live. So if you want to have a look at a three-level guide, um, the chapter that Kelly McGraw and I wrote, which is the, the first chapter of this book, it's called Our Stories, something, I can't remember what it's called, something like that. Um, you can see a three-level guide for a particular text and how we were encouraging or thinking about how we might encourage students to read differently at these different levels. So I'm imagining or hoping that you can see the way in which this might take us beyond the literal Clearly, um, what we, I mean, it's not enough usually to just ask these questions of students and expect that they can do it. But um, anyway, can I have someone who's prepared to read this for us? Or at least read the first paragraph? Yeah, keep going. Thank you. Okay. So where might we start with a text like this? This is the beginning of a short story. Okay, I'll tell you that much. Could we learn anything from here? Or would you do something else with it? What do you do with it when you're confronted with it? How do you make meaning?
from this text. Could we first speculate? What do you think is going on here? Anybody? A woman's taking her children to get away. What might she getting away from, do you think? Do you have any clues? Any other ideas? Can we look at the language? Does it help us? Any clues? What do we do as readers when we confront a text like this without a whole lot of context? I haven't given you the name of the story. You don't know who's written it. You don't know any of those features. But you're already working to try and piece things together. What else can we piece together? How is the author using language here to key us into some of the... Yeah, what? That's interesting, isn't it? So you're getting a sense of the, the rhythm of the language and the way it's keying you into... Do you think it's about when the text was written or what the text is describing? Mm, interesting. So let's pick up the railway station thing. You think that that's that sort of stood out to you? It seems like if she was desperate to get away, why would you take the train? The train takes probably further than some other means of transport. <laughs> further than walking. <laughs> Okay, but already we're speculating, aren't we? We're we're trying to work things out. All of these things might be true or not true. Is there any value in in doing this sort of exercise, or is it sort of just frustrating and annoying? Is it tuning us into the way we read? These are reading processes, right? Where you're predicting, speculating, thinking about how language is giving this particular piece of text a tone and a flavour, a context, a history. Isn't this what expert readers do? Look closely at language. Right. We've, got, we've only got four lines, right? And already we're neck deep in it. How do we know? What do we not know? What would be useful to know more about? Where she is? Do we have any details about where she is? Okay, so she's likely, is she rural? Well, she's likely to be perhaps in an urban setting maybe. Maybe not? Oh, they don't really have train stations in the country, do they? <laughs> okay, well, give us your, give us your reading. Okay, so maybe it's a rural setting. Sorry? anywhere hmm. okay so it's outside <laughs> yeah they're outside at the moment right yeah so the, the story is actually called on the train it's by an author named Olga Masters does anyone know the work of Olga Masters you've all got your laptops there why don't you google it here's the book collected stories can anyone see the um that's right. Okay. So, what does that tell you? Mm -hmm. And Australian or international? Australian. So, Olga Masters is an Australian author. Okay. Let's keep going. So, what are we doing here? So, we're 
engaging in a process where we're letting the story unfold, we're asking really basic questions about it as a way to tune in our senses to think about how does reading work? Speculating, what's going on? How do we know that? What do we not know? We're engaging in some prediction. What might happen next? What do you think? What might happen next? Is she going to make it to the train station? Is an abusive ex-boyfriend, husband going to run out of the house and run down the street after them? Maybe she'll get on the train and start a new life? What do you think? Does it? Yeah, if we look at the title. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the kids get on the train without him. Maybe he's on the train. Maybe he's on the train. <laughs> Anything. So, what, 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 when, we're, when we're predicting stories, when we're predicting what might happen, what are we doing? What sort of reading process is that? What are we basing our predictions on? How do we know what might happen? How is that even possible? Right. So we know the kind of way in which stories develop. So what sort of genre of story is this? Could you place it? Don't know yet? Could we call it a journey story or something? Maybe an escape story or something? So we, we activate our genre knowledge and understandings when we're trying to figure out and predict, don't we? It's pretty clear. Can we then reflect? Do you like it? Is it intriguing enough for you to read? Or is that only because we've paused over it for a little while and thought about it? Who wouldn't want to read on? Anybody? okay you don't fail <laughs> you don't want to read it what makes it work and not work these are sorts of questions that that you're used to asking kids in classrooms are they allowed to not like what you're doing <laughs> what might the author have done differently uh, and why and perhaps finally exploring what would you like to know more about as you read the story and i think one of the keys here is what in your own life influences the way you make meaning from the story? Can you connect to it in any way? Have you seen books and stories like this before? And how do they end? Um, perhaps have you experienced something like this before in your life? Has anyone ever taken a train journey? Has anyone not ever been on a train? I just don't want to make any assumptions. So, just to, just to pause it for a second. So, we're not, we're not just running, we're not doing an activity just so that you can write an activity and say, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. And it may not be the best idea. Maybe you don't like that idea. What we do want you to do, though, is think about what's, what's going on. What do we learn about reading from doing an activity like this? How can we become more sensitized to the processes of reading so that we can better understand them, first thing, better talk about them? and maybe do something about them with the students we work with. How could we work with these ideas? That's the question we want you to ask and to think about. We hope, for example, um, that you're not just going to give comprehension ex exercises to students when you get them to read a short story. So there might be other ways to engage with an initial foray into reading texts. Okay, let's look at some other possibilities. So. Um, what might we do with front covers and blurbs? Okay, here's some ideas and opportunities. Front covers allow us to imagine and tease out possibilities. Front covers often set up expectations of genre, values, narratives, and make these things quite explicit. Blurbs frame possibilities, again, around genre, values, narrative, um, and help us to closely study language. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. Has anyone read this book? J.C. Burke's book, 
the story of Tom Brennan? Did anyone study it at school? Good. Oh, you did? Did you? Yeah, but I didn't actually read it. I didn't read it, though. <laughs> like, whatever. Which is really bad, but yeah, I didn't. Okay, that's all right. So let's read the blurb now. You probably didn't. I don't know if you got that far, but maybe we can... <laughs> we can... Uh, sort of, you know. Okay, 2005, Random House. So already we're making something of this text, aren't we? We're reading before we get into the book. Okay, so Daniel Brennan, it was an accident waiting to happen. For Tom Brennan, life is about rugby, mates and family, until a night of celebration changes his life forever. Okay, are your genre conventions and expectations already being set up here? What sort of story are we, are we reading? That's the sort of question you might want to ask yourself. Where have we seen these sorts of stories before? How do we know what might likely happen? Tom's world's... Tom's world's... Exp- okay, yeah, so clearly there's some typos here. Sorry, that must have been my quick typing. Or maybe it's the blurb I copied and pasted from. Tom's world's <laughs> explodes as his brother Daniel is sent to jail and the Brennans are forced to leave the small town Tom's lived in his whole life. Tom is a survivor, but he needs a ticket out of the past just as much as Daniel. Okay, so do you think if we um, were studying a book like this with a group of... What, who, what, what year level might this go with, do you think? When might you teach this? What year were you in when you didn't read the book? <laughs> um, year nine, I'm pretty sure. Year nine? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> what an exciting book <laughs> okay it's not, it's not yeah okay anyway so year eight year seven year eight year nine something like that what um can we make a guess at the sort of issues and ideas that are going to emerge from a text like this just from reading the blurb could we generate a list could i get you to do that as a table generate a list of five themes that you think are likely to emerge from a reading and study of this text Okay, I'm not going to tell you what they are. I know what they are. There's only six of them. I'm going to ask you to do five. If you get them wrong, big trouble. Okay, you, you need to have five. Okay, you're going to stop, 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 stop. What have you got? What have you got? Call them out. What do you guys have? Uh, family. Family. Did anyone have family? Okay. Can we have another one? Coming of age. Uh, masculinity. Masculinity. What about over the back there? Identity. You guys? Friendship. Conflict between the familiar and the unknown. You have to up the ante, huh? <laughs> bring, in, bring in the theme. What about you guys down the back there? Anything else? Sorry? Loss. Yeah, okay. So... Um, wouldn't that, I don't know, it seems to me like that's a better idea than starting a class with a new text and telling the kids what the themes are. Just saying. Right? What about this one? Anyone read this book? Or seen the film? Yeah, it's one of my faves from the last couple of years. It's a great book. So here we have um, Jasper Jones. This one's got a little uh, award on the front. Book of the Year. Ooh, I wonder what that does. Maybe it tells kids, I don't want to read that. Late on a hot summer night in the tail end of 1965, Charlie Buckton, a precocious and bookish boy of 13, is startled by an urgent knock on his window of his, on the window of his sleep out. His visitor is Jasper Jones, an outcast from the regional mining town of Corrigan. Rebellious, mixed race and solitary, Jasper is a distant figure of danger and intrigue. Jasper takes him through town and onto a secret glade in the bush, and it's here that Charlie bears witness to Jasper's horrible discovery. With his secret like a brick in his belly, Charlie's pushed and pulled by the town, by a town closing in on itself in fear and suspicion. We could do the same thing, yeah? We could take a couple of minutes, we could think about the cover, we could think about the blurb here and the possibilities that are opened up to us before we even open the book. Right? We're already doing a whole bunch of reading. We're bringing our experiences we're bringing our prior understandings and our prior skills Fleur's just um told me a story of going to see um see films with an engineering friend of hers where um she realized that the ability to read 
um, and to intuit, to speculate and to predict are skills that need to be learned uh, often. She was surprised when her friend, the engineer, was always surprised by twists and turns in the film because he hadn't seen the foreshadowing or hadn't noticed that those things were being communicated. So what we're suggesting to you is the sorts of work we're doing here around speculation, prediction, reflection and exploring are really important parts of learning to read and developing a set of skills that allows young people to read sensitively and carefully. But it can be done with almost anything. Can you see that? We're not, we're not in Shakespeare here. We're in young adult fiction, thinking carefully and reading closely. We're looking at stuff before we've even opened the text. This is one of my favourite memes from the last little while too. So here's a student. This is just an aside. Hey, Mr Sylvie. So I don't know how he's... It looks like it's some messenger or something. Right? Um, so there's a kid asking... Um, the guy who just writ, wrote Jasper Jones. I was wondering what genre your novel Jasper Jones is. I've got an exam tomorrow. <laughs> I can't seem to find anyone that knows. <laughs> Kevin, Jasper Jones is best described as a paranormal space Viking dystopian, dystopian romance. All the best. <coughs> does that fit with <laughs> anyone's reading of the text? I'm not sure it does. Anyway, so we could do this work all day, right? Just with covers and blurbs. What are we doing? Well, part of what we're doing is related to the, this first dimension of the framing model that we're going to talk about now. So really we're thinking in a way, or we're thinking or we're bringing, or f our reading is framed here by circumtextual elements. So this is the first of four dimensions for the frame, circumtextual. Okay? So here we're talking about the way that texts are packaged, advertised and distributed, for example. And the point of the framework, that McLaughlin and Reed's framework, is to let us was to sensitise us to the fact that all texts and all reading is circumtextually framed in some way. And when we're talking about novels, we might think about the dimensions that are there in blue: presentation, cover, the publisher. We had a comment about publisher here when we looked at Olga Masters, Central Queensland University, for example. The series. Does that make a difference? Of course it does. Think about the series you've read before, the author's name, titles and blurbs, prizes that the book or author might have won, reviews, epigraphs, introductions or prefaces afterwards, and um, bibliographies. All of these things shape our reading of the text before we even sort of enter the text. Sometimes we think of the reading as only happening after we open the first page. Clearly uh, there's more going on. Okay, let's take an example. So these are the questions I want you to think about as I show you a clip from um, a recent film. Okay, I don't know how this is going to work, but we'll give it a go. You'll have plenty of time out while you're cleaning out the basement. Are you gonna help or are you too pretty? I'm too pretty. What's this? A game for those who seek to find a way to leave their world behind. Jumanji. You pick a character and you're that person in the game. Which one do I pick? I don't think it matters that much. Spinbar. Sounds like a badass. I'll be the curvy genius. Dr. Smolder Bravestone. I guess I'm Ruby Roundhouse. the rest of me oh my god fridge yeah i'm fridge who are you it's me spencer who is she martha why am i wearing half a shirt and short shorts in the jungle i think we got sucked into jumanji and we become the avatars we chose so that means bethany oh Wait, bethany don't look at it <gasps> I'm an overweight middle-aged man. Well, I don't have my claret in, and all I see around here is Paula. Well, I don't have a top two feet of my body. Damn, that is a man right there. Don't cry, don't cry. Don't cry, it's gonna be okay. Welcome to the jungle. This is a video game, which means we all have special skills. Whatever 
That was so intense. I like Kent even with this place. Watch your step in here. Okay, so can I get you to uh, think about what you just watched, but if I can manage to drive this thing, we're going to go back to these questions that we started with. Okay. Can I get you to just have a brief one-minute discussion with your group about these questions? How do we read this text? What sort of film are we watching? What sort of world are we entering? And how do we make meaning from it? Can we explain how that text works? Is that okay? Just for a minute? Right, it's not an isolated film, is it? It's uh, You have to have that pre-existing, like, pre well, you don't have to, but it helps to understand the nuances of the jokes and the irony and stuff that you do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, given time, we're going to keep moving. So what did you make of these, uh, this film? Can we get any read on some of these questions? Um, Molly said uh, before over here, I'm just going to say what you said, Molly, because it sounds good. Um, she said you, you can't really, well, you can, read this film as a standalone film or the trailer but clearly it does some of its work it works in some way because of its references to all the other films like this like the original people seen the original Jumanji film but lots of other texts and we'll talk about that in a sec any other insights beyond that how do we make sense of it what sort of world is this well the music kind of gives it away doesn't it though because you're getting it right right what does the music give away to you what, what does it do Yep, we're getting a clear sense of that. Mm. Yep. Others? Uh, other? Uh, any other dimensions? Is this just a jungle action flick? The fact that um, when John Cena's in it too, you just know what kind of a movie it's going to be because mm. he's in it. Okay. And so Jack Black as well, he's hilarious. It's going to be funny in parts. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the prior actor roles. They, they bring something to this and our experience of their work shapes our reading here. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Any other thoughts? Even if you've never seen a movie in English before for whatever reason, you could probably still tell that it was meant to be a comedy by the way that it's cut mm -hmm. and the way that and, and the timing and stuff. Yep. Um but you can also tell it's not a straightforward jungle action flick because things in it that you wouldn't just find if you're strolling through the rainforest. Mm -hmm. There's blowy rocks and the animals are extra gigantic and vicious and um, that one girl flies through the air. <laughs> <laughs> That's as far as I got. Yep, I think, I think you're absolutely right though. So the film is signalling that it's, it's doing something jungly and an action adventure, but it's signalling a whole bunch of other stuff too, isn't it? And it does that through the way it's cut the way the characters respond, the look of the film, all of that, right? We're not doing a media visual analysis here, but we could do that, right? That would help us to understand what, what, what's going on in the film. Our point today is that we've got this framework that we're trying to think about. So circumtextual is one way that texts are framed, but um, we haven't quite got there yet because I've just showed you, well, part of, the, part of the clip. So let's have a look at a couple of others. So, whoop, circumtextual. Okay, maybe we'll, maybe we'll do that. So here's a, a um, poster from the film. So we've watched the trailer, we've looked at um, this poster. Um, we could do quite a lot with that. We've already seen the way in which we can work with posters and blurbs. Um, just as the trailer does itself, this cues us into a whole range of different ways of understanding the film. And we could talk about that. Um, we've got the original. Um, did anyone talk about that at all in their discussion? Yep. Um, 
So those are important, second textual again. Um, we're going to move on to extra textual because of our time. Now, extra textual is often one that people are... It's probably the one that's most easiest to grasp, I suppose, because it's usually what we think of when we think of bringing something to the text. The whole sort of personal, cultural and ideological baggage that we carry with us that helps to shape the reading. So making those considerations explicit in your teaching, our individual beliefs and attitudes, our prejudices, our assumptions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all shaped the way that, um, that we make meaning from texts. So circumtextual, things that are around the text, extra textual, stuff that we bring to the text. Um, so one way to think about extra textual, I suppose, in this sense is that the film is somehow playing with differences isn't it the character differences and how they shape the uh, the gameplay and interactions so it would be interesting to think about which characters the students most relate to and perhaps why that is just as a as a quick aside um, our third frame intra textual so this is where the, the idea that we when we read um, or what we read as we progress through a text is always framed by what we've already read in the same texts. Okay, so we're thinking here about reading as a process of constant reframing or readjusting our frame. So as we looked at with Olga Masters, um, we predicted, we speculated, and so as we would discover more in the text, we would be doing intra-textual work. So chapters and chapter headings, paragraphs, margins, white space, footnotes, transpositions, juxtapositions, narrative embedding, reading differently at the beginning to how we read at the end, those sorts of things. When we know we're at the end, what do we know? If there's still unresolved issues in a text, they're likely going to be resolved in the next chapter or two, right? So we're doing in intratextual work. And finally, intertextual. This is probably the other element of the frame that's most easy to understand, the idea of intertextual um, frames reference to or incorporation of other texts or text types so we could spend some time thinking about how Jumanji works in that level couldn't we what sort of intertextual references is it opening up for us video, games. video games yep what else what other text does it remind you of when you watch Jumanji sorry the previous one yep anything else So here's, here's a still from the poster, or from the, the original. This is what it makes me think of. Any relation there? It's kind of the same, same idea, isn't it? We know this film. We know this character. So I don't mean to kind of keep flicking back and forth between that. It's just <laughs> sort of happening. Or this one? Oh Video games? It seems to me this is some kind of connection here and one way to understand that how the text works intertextually. What about these ones? Do you remember this old thing? No. Sorry? He's now an old thing, isn't he? Doesn't look so old there, does he? So it seems to me that, um, that a text like Jumanji in, intertextually references a whole range of texts. We can't understand Jumanji as a text really... Um, unless we understand the way in which it borrows from and uh, repackages other sorts of ideas in other texts. Um, some of you may even know this one, although back to Alan Quatermain. Yeah, this sort of stuff. Right, Jungle Adventures, um, the, uh, you know, um, <laughs> anyway, we're running out of time. So what, maybe we'll finish here. So what might we make of such a framework? So we've got circumtextual, extra textual, the stuff we bring, the stuff that surrounds the text, intra, how we read differently as we proceed through a text, and intertextual, those, those texts that also make some sense because they're referenced by this. We haven't got to um, the curriculum stuff there, but maybe we'll do that next time. In workshops, we'll take up some of these ideas and look at them in more detail. But I would suggest that uh, you spend some time reading McLaughlin's piece, thinking about these frameworks, and in particular, thinking about how your reading is framed in these sorts of ways in any text that you, um, 
that you come up against.